Okay, hello everybody and welcome to Investing with IBD sponsored by MarketSmith. Today is August 19th, 2020. I'm your host, Arusha Shapiris, and today we have Kathy Wood on the show. Kathy is the founder, CEO, and CIO of ARK Invest Management. Thanks for being here, Kathy. Thank you, Arusha. I'm very happy to be here. On today's podcast, we're going to talk about the current markets, disruptive trends, and then we will end the episode with a few current ideas. So let's get into the current market. The market continues to be in a strong uptrend. We have three distribution days on the NASDAQ and S&P 500. Kathy, what are your thoughts on this market and also just 2020? Oh, well, 2020 has been pretty wild, of course. Yep. Um, uh, during the coronavirus, uh, I started doing YouTube videos on Fridays just each, each week to hold our clients and prospective clients, anyone's hands. I mean, we did have a point of view, and that point of view was that we were setting up for a very powerful V-shaped recovery. And I, I, I think a lot of people found it very difficult to understand that at the time. Yeah. Um, but now we're seeing it. What we've seen is consumers coming back very strongly, businesses scrambling to catch up to them, inventories are falling, uh, they can't keep them on the shelves. This is the definition of a V-shaped recovery. The other thing that we wanted to emphasize for our clients was that during difficult times, uh, that innovation usually takes off. And the reason it does is because it solves problems. Think of all the problems that, the, that this pandemic has created. Right. Um, we're working uh, digitally now, of course, and uh, education is online. Uh, cash, we're not passing cash anymore. Right. So, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, innovation solves problems. And I think the big surprise to us has been to hear companies say, that they didn't expect to see some of the customers they're seeing now for five years. We actually have had uh, companies say that. And some of them have withdrawn guidance, not because they don't know how low uh, their business is going to go, but they don't know how long this is going to last. Has, have we just pulled forward activity or have we accelerated change that was underway and, and was going to take place and, and extend over many, many years. Well, how long do you think these changes, do you think these are permanent changes with the work from home uh, th uh, and, and things like that, people ordering a lot more on, online? Uh, do, do you think that now we've finally had that kind of shift that we've all kind of been expecting? Yeah, I think, well, I think it's happening faster now because of the, the coronavirus. I think it would have happened much more slowly over time. I mean, think about how uh, we viewed working remotely before right, we exactly. had to do it. Yep. You know, uh, there was some question, uh, you know, is this person really working? Or that was the prevailing wisdom. Right. I think most of us are understanding now that we are more productive. We have become more productive. Certainly at ARC Invest, we've become more productive, but we're seeing that uh, from our clients, from our companies. Uh, I think we've stepped up in productivity. I think uh, they, the, the GDP accounts uh, productivity was up something like 7% at an annualized rate. These are crazy figures. Normally productivity yeah. grows in, if, if we're lucky it's growing and it grows in the one to 2% range. We're now in the high single digits and I think it's gonna continue for a while. Yeah, I, I mean, we've definitely seen that at Investor Business Daily too. Uh, we're all working from home, we're a lot more productive and, and in many ways, uh, it's kind of hard to argue going back to kind of the normal full five day week period. You no, know, I agree. I agree. I mean, and, and now we're, I think, in a healthy way, uh, trying to figure out the, the differentiation between work and the rest yes. of our lives. Uh, I, I think there are some healthy, uh, there, I think people are getting more into exercise. I'm seeing a lot of that in our own firm. So, uh, you know, there are some very positive uh, uh, results coming out of this, however devastating some of the results have been. Yeah. And now, now one of the, the latest news items over the, the last couple of weeks uh, that's been kind of just all over the financial news is uh, the, the news going on with TikTok and President Trump uh, 
you get, try, warning that you might ban it and maybe Microsoft is going to acquire it. Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on TikTok and also uh, WeChat by Tencent? Yeah, it's been interesting to watch that, of course. Um, TikTok, I put it, I put the app on my phone uh, about three months ago. So now okay. I guess the Chinese government knows everything about me. <laughs> but, but guess what? I, I already thought that the Chinese government knew everything about me because I've traveled there so much. Yeah. So, so it's no surprise to me. Um, we've talked to some cybersecurity experts. We have a business brainstorm, on, not a business, a, a research brainstorm on Fridays. Uh, and uh, some cybersecurity experts do not believe that TikTok is a, a, a security risk per se. A privacy risk, sure. Um, so I found that to be interesting. They would they they think that you know five G and some of what Huawei had been doing was much more of a risk. Okay. Um, I wonder if uh, if somehow there was there were some conversations going on. Uh, before uh, the Trump administration came out with the news because uh, the head of streaming at Disney left to run streaming at TikTok globally. Uh, so that's a U.S. Uh, executive. Yeah. Um, it could be. Uh, I have also been surprised there hasn't been more of a retaliation. So again, I wonder how much back and forth there has been uh, that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. It's been interesting to watch Facebook with its reels. Um, yes. Some people think that is just as addictive as TikTok. And maybe one of the reasons is it includes a lot of TikTok videos. So, uh, I, I, you know, it's kind of hard to figure that out. I think what uh, we've also focused on is... Um, because China is becoming so politically sensitive when it comes to these kinds of services, we're watching a company called C, mm -hmm. uh, the, the C, C e limited. A, I mean, S E A. Yes. And the ticker is S E mm -hmm. uh, Singapore based and uh, actually 35% owned by Tencent. Uh, and it is in a, surreptitious kind of way, making its way around Southeast Asia and into Latin America and growing just incredibly fast. So I yeah. think Tencent is now, you know, basically uh, enabling uh, some of these other companies by giving them lots of helpful hints and probably a lot of uh, support. So uh, we're, we're watching that dynamic as well. Yeah, well, uh, talking about Tencent, I mean, it seems like Tencent inve uh, invests in like every new company in, in Asia. They, they really place their bets in a lot of where you would think that they might be competitors. Yes. They're, they're partnering up. And I've always thought that was an interesting strategy. Yeah, we uh, tallied, actually, we talked about it this morning at our morning meeting. We've ta we tallied the top 100 companies uh, in which Tencent is invested. And I think that uh, right there is $200 billion. Wow. Uh, right, right, worth. So uh, it's very interesting. Tencent's had a very open mind this way. And, um, you know, they want to participate no matter where and, yeah. and, and no matter how. So Kathy, let, let's get, let's go back and, and, and you know, just walk us through how you got started in investing and, and how you got into this business. Oh, okay. Yes. I was at uh, USC. Uh, yeah. That's the University of Southern California. And um, I have to say that because I just bought a place in South Carolina and there's a USC there too. Oh, I know. Yeah. Now okay. they're, they're very sensitive of that, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> which I don't blame them, but no, uh, I agree. I agree. But I, as you can see in the background there, I have a USC helmet. I, I, I went to USC <laughs> business school uh, there we at go. Marshall. Yeah, so we're a fight on. <laughs> I'll fight on. Yeah. So uh, I met Professor Art Laffer there, Art Laffer, Laffer Curve, Supply Side Economics. Yeah, wow. Uh, he was teaching in the graduate school. I was an undergrad, but I befriended one of his assistants, and all of us were taking night classes, and he was giving a night class. And um, he suggested that I uh, uh, become, that I join his program, and, uh, and he let me apply or the school let me apply his courses and, 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 and the program that he and his protégés brought with them from the University of Chicago to uh, my undergraduate degree. So my love of economics started there, but really what that was, was a love of trying to figure out the way the world worked and the way the world 
was going to work. Mm -hmm. So really trying to understand the future. Art introduced me to Capital Group on the West Coast. So, yeah. you know, and I didn't even, I was a junior in college. This was 1977. Um, and I, I didn't even know about this business. You know, I was a junior in college and mm -hmm. the investment world was out of favor then. We had been in right. an inflationary period and bonds were out of favor, equities were out of favor. No one wanted to work for an investment firm. They are all going to consulting firms. Mm -hmm. And that's where I learned, hey, when everybody does this and you do that, maybe there's a great, uh, uh, that's a good idea. Um, so I started there, but they were trying to figure out what was going to happen to Hong Kong in 1997. So it was 1977, yeah, 20 years. And I said, I want to be in this business. And then when I moved to Jenison Associates here in New York, three years later, um, I had the privilege of being able to move into equity research and portfolio management. But in order to earn my stripes, I had to figure out my own universe. And okay. as Sig Sigalis, the CIO still there, uh, said, you know, our analysts are lifers. And so you're just going to have to figure out your own universe, something that's not already being followed. Well, wow. what, what was that? The, these were companies that were IPOing that kind of fell through the cracks. Uh, the Reuter, Reuters. What was that? Well, it was yeah. called a database publishing company at the time. Hmm, where do we follow that? Well, it's not a database company, so the tech guys didn't want it. It wasn't a publishing company, so the publishing guys didn't want it. Yeah. And, and so I put my hand up. And of course, that was the very early stages of what would become the internet, right? That's so incredible. That, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. So I mean, all these great new companies fell to you. They uh, fell and, through and the cracks. Yeah, and, and a lot of times I, I almost feel like in equity research or even just economics, uh, everyone has a tendency to stick with the companies that are doing well right now. Mm -hmm. so I, I, it is kind of interesting that you, you with an economics degree, you, you were attracted to disruptors and a lot of these newer companies. Yes, yes. And I think the other reason was I learned an important lesson in economics when I started in the business. When I moved over to Jenison in economics, uh, uh, inflation and interest rates were well into the double digits. And uh, with the guidance of Art Laffer and watching Paul Volcker, uh, I, uh, we, we made the call that, hey, inflation and interest rates are going to peak and they're going to come down and multiples will expand. Well, no one was thinking about that. I mean, Henry Wojnarowski, uh, uh, these, pro I mean, Henry Kaufman, Al Wojnarowski, Gary Wayne Milton Friedman himself, none of them thought that that was true. They all thought oh, inflation wow. and interest rates were embedded in the system at a double digit rate. So again, here's another example. Everyone was moving that way. Yeah. And we basically at Jenison said, no, we think this. And it was a wonderful time to start investing. Incredible. Uh, so, so after that, you, you went on to, to co-found a hedge fund too, right? Yes. After 18 years at uh, Jenison, uh, wow. Tupelo Capital, uh, one of my, uh, Lulu Wang, one of my uh, colleagues at Jenison and I moved on. Uh, to manage her family's um, uh, fortune, or at least a part of it. And, uh, and the reason we wanted to do this is it, uh, it was opening us up to the, the world. Uh, it was a hedge fund. Uh, we had a lot of agility. And there was, it, was, it was the beginning of the, well, it was in the middle of the internet bubble. And we saw all of these opportunities. Yeah. Uh, so it was a great time to start a hedge fund because, you know, after a while, you realized, okay, now they're counting eyeballs to value these companies. This is not going to end well. <laughs> right. And so, you know, we did, we did very well. And it was an exciting time to, to learn uh, how to run a hedge fund and to be global as well. Very exciting. And then, and then, then after that, you went to Lyons Bernstein, right? Yes, they were looking. So uh, Lulu and her family decided to remain uh, in a family office instead of building out, which was our original plan. So yes, I joined Lyons Bernstein and be I became a chief investment officer of global thematic investing. Wow. And uh, it was during the tech and telecom bust 
And so ironically, you know, we took our portfolios down to, I remember, 11% tech when the indexes were 35 to 40%. And uh, honestly, I think most most people thought it was political suicide to do that. Um, and, it, and, it, and, and, it, and the reason I did it was I'd never at Jenison or at Tupelo paid attention to the benchmarks. Uh, but uh, we had moved into a world where benchmark style investing and uh, benchmarks uh, themselves were becoming very important, sort of a centerpiece of um, certainly quantitative research. So maybe ignorance was bliss, but it really helped me not to care that the tech, (laughs) that tech was 35 to 40% of these indices and to make that move uh, because it did pay off. Mm -hmm. And so what inspired you to to leave Alliance Bernstein and and start uh, ARK Invest? Well, so the move towards benchmark style investing and, and, and passive generally in the business, not, mm-hmm. not uh, Alliance Bernstein, yeah. that gained some momentum after the tech and telecom bust or during it. But uh, after 08, 09, it became embedded, I think, in most traditional asset managers. So we were already a bit of an odd duck. Yeah. A different duck. And after 08, 09, I think, uh, I, th- I think there was a feeling that, uh, you know, this, the strategy we were uh, uh, involved with was very volatile. And, um, and I think they would have liked to have risk completed our portfolios, but that, that is something that wouldn't have been appropriate for what we do. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to do that I could not do at Alliance Bernstein, and, or, nor could we do it at any traditional investment firm. This is nothing, uh, 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 this is not saying anything about Alliance Bernstein. Uh, I wanted to open up our research and share it with the world. I wanted to develop the equivalent of an open source research ecosystem patterned after open source software. And awesome. yeah, and, it, and, and this was an idea that came to me in August of 2012. Why don't you disrupt the financial services industry, or at least the asset management part of it, with some of the technologies that have disrupted other industries? Uh, social media and uh, uh, being a very important part of that, but just opening up generally um, because I wanted our analysts to uh, engage with the innovators and and these innovators are on social media. I never dreamed in 2012 that Twitter would be the social network that um, that was the best suited for this. Back then it was tweens, teens, celebrities. And I thought it would be LinkedIn or you know something yeah. else. But Twitter was it and has been really important to us. We are now, I believe, a part of the communities we are researching in a much more profound way than most analysts and portfolio managers can be. And that's because we're willing to share our research. Well, at a traditional asset management firm, a compliance department is not going to turn itself upside down for one portfolio team among dozens, especially because most of them, most of those inside uh, compliance do not use social media and, you know, don't and, and are more fearful of the ex, of how much how vulner, vulnerable it might make uh, the organization. No, that, that that makes a lot of sense. I've I've enjoyed a lot of the research over the years that that your team has shared, and uh, it's it's right up our alley here at Investment uh, Investors Business Daily uh, with a lot of the stocks that we find coming up on our radar. So let's take a quick break here. Uh, The market continues to be in an uptrend and leading stocks are acting well. Uh, When we return, we are gonna talk about some of the disruptive trends that are changing the world today. We'll be back. 
I am here with Scott St. Clair. Scott's one of our senior product coaches at MarketSmith. Now, Scott, there are a ton of publicly traded stocks just on the U.S. I think it's over 5,000 stocks. Who has the time to go through all of these stocks and find the very best ones? Yeah, most people don't, right? So what you need is a tool like MarketSmith. We have decades of research on what makes a great winning stock. So we've done all the research for you. So we're going to try to highlight those specific stocks with those great data points. So if you're looking for that next great potential big winner, orange stock ideas button, you just click on it and you've got some of the main reports that we use, including the Growth 250. Yeah, and the Growth 250 is the first list that I go through on the weekends. Yeah, it's the most popular one, but there are others. There's the Breaking Out Today, Stocks Near a Pivot, and then the Blue Dot List, right, which is very popular. It's going to show you the stocks with the best relative strength. So we've done a lot of the work for you. What you have to do is review these lists. You're going to come up with some of the best ideas in that current market environment. Perfect. Mark Smith saves you time and makes investment research that much easier. For more information, go to Investors.com slash podcast 2020. Kathy Wood is our guest on Investing with IBD, sponsored by Market Smith. Okay, Cappy, let's get into some of the disruptive trends. And let's start out with the genomic revolution, because this one, we know it's out there, it's starting to happen, but it's kind of hard for, I think, a lot of us to really grasp how revolutionary this is. Yeah, well, I think one of the reasons it's hard to grasp is, um, is what we discussed earlier the cracks that this is falling through. Uh, Technology is going to impact healthcare more profoundly, I think, than anyone now understands. There is a convergence among uh, DNA sequencing, artificial intelligence, and CRISPR gene editing, which is going to lead to cures for disease. Now, uh, it's very interesting to hear our genomics analysts talk about this. It's almost burying it. As I, as a portfolio manager, have to say, they'll say something like curative therapies. I said, you mean cures? And, <laughs> you know, and I, I still think that, I, I think people don't believe that because it really hasn't happened before, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, let's start with the CRISPR gene editing, because this is, I remember when I learned about this a, a little while ago, it was mind boggling yes. that, that they could do this. And yes. uh, so it walk us through this technology and how it could lead to a, a, a lot of cures. So let me back up and start with DNA sequencing. Okay, and yes. and uh, now we're able to find the needle in the haystack, right? Yep. So, uh, you know, we have, three billion base pairs of DNA. That's a lot of hay, right? And to find one mutation uh, was impossible before. Just impossible. Yeah. If it was possible, it was way too expensive. So the tech and telecom bubble was beautiful because it planted the seeds for everything that's happening now. But it was way too expensive back then. That's why... Uh, that's one of the reasons we took technology down to 10% of the portfolio back then. It cost $2.7 billion to sequence the first whole human genome. Even if costs had come down by 75% the next year, we weren't ready for prime time. Now we're down to, uh, well, by some measures, some private companies can do it for $500 to sequence your genomic profile. $2.7 billion in 2003 to $500, that's Veritas, it's George Church's company. Um, and uh, Invite is the molecular diagnostic company that uh, is driving down the cost curve from a testing point of view and really gonna revolutionize testing as well. Uh, so now, because we can sequence a person's genome for that um, low amount of money, we're going to be able to identify mutations from one sequence to the next. So uh, many people think, oh, you'll just be sequenced once in your life when you're born and that's your DNA. No, there are mutations all the time and they can be caused by heredity, they can be caused by stress, environment, poor diet, 
all kinds of things, right? Right. So we are all going to have geneticists and we are going to find out from our geneticists uh, from one year to the next or every two years, what mutations have mutated. That's like finding the needle in that haystack, right? Yeah. Why do we want to know that? Because a mutation is a programming error. Something's gone haywire. Uh, and uh, it is the earliest manifestation of disease. Okay? So we've got now. The reason we're able to, to find this is artificial intelligence. Artificial sequencing and artificial intelligence are uh, helping us understand the pathways for disease. CRISPR gene editing, once we figured out the mutation, mm -hmm. is able to reprogram the, the error uh, and really reverse the disease. Artificial intelligence uh, might be able to help us understand uh, when we're heading for stage one cancer, right? Yep. So we artificial intelligence might help us understand that. But let's say we, we're, we don't get, we're, it, it isn't that good for a number of years. If we do get stage one cancer, we believe that CRISPR gene editing is evolving fast enough now that we will be able to reprogram that error. Now, uh, we're already seeing CRISPR cure humans of sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. Um, CRISPR Therapeutics is the company uh, involved here in those two uh, human trials. And the trials, no news is good news. We would find out, there are so many trials going on right now, we would find out if it was not working. Of that, I'm convinced they'd have to stop if something really bad happened. Uh, no news is good news. We just had a, a, a webinar with Jennifer Doudna, who's the co-inventor of CRISPR gene editing. And I said that to her. I said, is no news good news? And she didn't, she, she just smiled. It was clear. <laughs> it was clear. No news is good news. Yeah. But the news we're getting uh, is, it's almost rogue. These are patients who are coming, who are in trials and saying, I'm still in the trial. I'm cured. Uh, uh, Victoria Gray was one woman, sickle cell disease. She used to have to go to the emergency room six or seven times a year. Um, and the life expectancy of someone with sickle cell disease is in the 50s. She has not had to go to the hospital in a year, and she's still on the trial. Beta thalassemia, a man in the, uh, in the CRISPR trial, uh, used to have 17 blood transfusions a year. And has not had one in one year. Again, no news is good news. Yeah. So those two have been announced, and we're going to see a lot more milestones this year. So CRISPR ther Therapeutics, and, and the ticker symbol for them is CRSP. So yes. they're a major player in this. But now they're, they're, there's another company that's uh, kind of battling out uh, for, I guess, with the patents for, for the yes. CRISPR technology, uh, EDAS, uh, EDITAS um, Medicine, EDITAS. right? Yes. Uh, ticker symbol, EDIT, E-D-I-T. Yes. yes. Why CRISPR over uh, EDITAS? Well, we own CRISPR therapeutics, Editas, and Intellia. Those are the three companies with the foundational patents. So Intellia is NTLA. Uh, those are the three companies with the foundational patents uh, for CRISPR gene editing. This is for Cas9, which is a particular enzyme, uh, and, and seems to be the one uh, that is finding most success right now. Jennifer Doudna confirmed that. Wow. Now, why are we invested in the three of them? Well, uh, we've learned from the technology world, not the healthcare world, but that technology world, that when, um, when, when there are advances like this uh, for the welfare of humankind, however you want to say it, um, and for the good of all the companies involved, cross-licensing will probably uh, uh, take place at the end of the day. Now, we think that CRISPR and Intellia are in stronger positions than Editas for CRISPR-Cas9. But, but, I mean, yeah, for CRISPR-Cas9. Editas, however, has another flavor of, uh, of 
CRISPR uh, that we think could be important in terms of pediatric blindness. Uh, uh, so uh, again, it may be in the weaker position, it'll be able to cross license, plus it has uh, another flavor of CRISPR, which could become very important. Very cool. Now, you you built a whole ETF around this, you know, so, so people don't necessarily have to worry about CRISPR or Editas or, or uh, some of these other companies. Uh, and so you, an ETF just, just based on genomics, right? Yes. The genomics revolution is what we call it. And uh, I think again, this convergence of artificial intelligence. So we own some tech companies in here, um, and not too many. I mean, it, it is predominantly genomics companies, but um, uh, the, the, the convergence of artificial intelligence, uh, uh, DNA sequencing, and uh, CRISPR gene editing is going to power other companies as well, uh, testing companies. I mentioned Invitae. Um, you know, in, in the world of artificial intelligence, the companies with the most data and the highest quality data are, are probably going to take the lion's share of the market. And we think Invitae could be that company in the molecular diagnostic space, um, especially now that they just brought, uh, bought Arch, a, a, li a liquid biopsy uh, company. Now, why do we say that? Uh, well, their tests are because of the amount of data they have collected and, and their willingness to go down the cost curve of DNA sequencing and price tests uh, as low as they possibly can so that they can uh, so that they can analyze all of these patients. They will then have access to data anonymized, of course, uh, that, that um, no one else will have, and they'll have more of it. The other thing they have that no one has right now is a network of geneticists globally. Not all of them work for Invitae, but they're part of a network. And uh, these geneticists are critical to helping doctors understand um, what the results of these DNA sequencing uh, exams are. Uh, so, so there's an important network evolving here, which again reinforces uh, the desire of people to go to a company like Invite. They have the expertise to uh, translate and, and decipher uh, what all these tests mean. Yeah, and, I mean, and, and if you take a step back, and, and you mentioned a number of tech companies, you know, the, the tech companies that really did well were the ones that could create this database or create this kind of go-to place like a Google or an Amazon. Uh, and so it's really interesting that Invitae here is is building this this database or something where all the medical professionals have to go to get all this information, even and also obviously a very very low cost for the tests. Yeah, they started in the hereditary world, but they have now moved into non-hereditary, which is called somatic. So it's going to be much bigger. And I think uh, here's another reason it's misperceived or it has been misperceived. Uh, lab companies like LabCorp and Quest Diagnostics, mm -hmm. they have been commoditized. And from a technology point of view, they are not very interesting companies from our point of view. They may be very interesting to value investors, but right. they're not to us. Nonetheless, they are perceived, uh, uh, testing companies are perceived as low margin and commoditized. That's why this is, is going to be such a surprise. Um, it is keeping its gross margins down to 50%. And that's because it wants to keep cutting prices so that uh, more and more doctors and payers yeah. will be attracted to its tests. Yeah. So it's being very wise that way. Yeah, and they're using the exact same strategy for that, that all the tech companies did 20 years yes, ago, which is absolutely. really interesting. And, and healthcare companies have not done that. They have believed in keeping prices as high as possible for as long as possible. Myriad Genetics, case in point. And that's why they're losing. So let's uh, talk about obviously a, a very a very big topic for all of us, COVID-19. What are some of the companies that are, are 
uh, really involved in helping defeat this. And, and, I'll, and I'll just bring one up now because I'm, I'm a fan of this company, Illumina. How, are, are they playing a role uh, in this with the sequencing? Yeah. So the, the COVID-19 coronavirus uh, was sequenced in two days uh, in China with Illumina machines. Um, Back in 2003, remember when I said the technology wasn't there and the cost wasn't there? It took five months to sequence that virus. And think about that. If you, if you don't have the sequence, if you don't understand the virus, you can't have a test. We wouldn't have had any tests uh, if, if we had had to wait for five months, of course. Yeah. Instead, two days. And then another company, Twist uh, Biosciences, um, was critical here. So Illumina read the genome. Uh, Twist was able to write it and send the instructions to Abbott and Cepheid. Cepheid's owned by Danaher. And they were able to then produce tests. So the turnaround time for sequencing was two days. The turnaround time so that's reading the sequence. The turnaround time for writing the sequence was two weeks, record time. That was twist. And uh, the testing companies then were within a month. We started to have uh, tests. Um, and I know there were some mistakes in the CDC uh, not allowing uh, uh, universities and so forth to participate. So that was a political mistake. But the, science, the scientific um, breakthroughs were there, two days, two weeks, uh, a month, uh, one to two months. Um, and then on the vaccine side, we have, and Moderna gets a lot of the publicity, mRNA, mm -hmm. um, and uh, as it should, it's, it's working at breakneck speed. Um, it is uh, an mRNA vaccine company. We've never had an mRNA vaccine before. I, um, Inno, no, in, Innovio, uh, I-N-O, is a DNA vaccine company. We've never done that before. Uh, and Arcturus, A-R-C-T, uh, is also an mRNA uh, vaccine company, but it is a self-replicating mRNA. That is the, that, that's its differentiation. It does not get much press. Um, and I, I have to tell you, it is one of our top positions in, um, in the genomic portfolio, not because we put it in there as a top position, it was too small a cap. It earned its way there wow. uh, because it struck a, a deal with Duke University and uh, Singapore. I think the Singapore, uh, it's one of the medical institutes in Singapore. And we believe that very soon after Moderna uh, has a vaccine, if not before, we're not sure about that, Arcturus will have one. And the difference will be, it will be a single dose, so you won't need a booster shot. Okay. Uh, and so far, uh, we know Israel is already working with Arcturus and has already ordered it. It'll be about $70 per vaccine. Uh, Moderna's will be $60 for the vaccine and a booster. So we think the compliance, uh, just one vaccine, uh, will win a lot of uh, business over to Arcturus, although there will be lots of room for both of them. Oh, that's perfect. I mean, that, that's, it's incredible because how many things, how many variables are going on and all, these, all this innovation is really helping out. Yeah, I think uh, just one more note on vaccines. Mm -hmm. the, the, the budgets for vaccines dried up after SARS in 03 because SARS made two, it was a coronavirus, it had made yeah. two rounds and then it just went poof. Right. So there was a mad rush, in, rush into vaccines then. Yeah. It went poof. There was no need for them. And really funding uh, dried up and, and, and we've had to rev it back up again. So understanding disruptive trends will help you develop more conviction in your stock. So you got a great example here of just one huge trend. So coming up next, we are gonna talk more about trends and we will also talk more about stocks. So stay tuned. 
Market Smith will give you a huge edge in the stock market. Better stocks, bigger profits. Market Smith is the top research platform for IBD. It's just the best tool for individual stock selection. Everything within Market Smith is designed to bring those best stocks to the surface. It does a lot of the work for you of filtering down to the potential leaders. It's when you take the training wheels off and you're ready to invest on a more professional level. Market Smith will help you take control of your investment life. If you want to get serious about investing, start your membership today. We are back with Kathy Wood on Investing with IBD, sponsored by Marketsmith. Okay, Kathy, let's go into a few ideas here. Now, the first one is, is uh, probably the, the, the most debated stock on the market. It is Tesla. And obviously, you're a big fan of Tesla. Why do you continue to like this idea? Uh, we still think it's way underestimated, even with the massive move it has had. It hit uh, $350 at the bottom in March mm -hmm. um, and is now 1900 roughly there. Right. Yeah, it went over 1900 and, and fell back a little bit today. Yes. Uh, and uh, even with this, um, our bear case for this stock has been 1500 Now that's a five-year price target. Okay. That assumed that Tesla would lose market share. We first made this analysis in 2018. 2018, Tesla had a 17% share of the global EV market, including China. Last year, I think I've got this number right, they had 23% share. We assumed for our bear case that Tesla would lose market share from that 17% and go down to, in our base case, 11%, and in our bear case, 6%. Instead, what has happened, it went up to 23% last year, and now I think we're up to, this is rough uh, as of mid-year, uh, uh, about 26%. So it's still increasing, has 79 to 80% share in the United States. And even in China, where I think there are 150 electric vehicle manufacturers, wow. crazy, crazy, um, Tesla has 21, had in June 21% of that market. Think about that, 150 and Tesla is 21%. Now, it's incredible, yeah. It is incredible. What's really interesting is Pinduoduo, yeah. which is a social commerce company. Yeah. It uh, basically is giving away a Tesla or there's some, or it's selling a Tesla, selling, selling Tesla on its network for a discount. And Tesla has had, uh, uh, has had to go to them and say, wait a minute, the customer is ours, not yours. So they, but think about that. Pinduoduo thinks this is so important in China is going to be such a business getter, yeah. uh, a driver for right. it, that it. So uh, that's, that's the first thing. So it's not losing share, it's gaining share. And in that bear case, we have nothing for autonomous at all, and nothing for ride hailing. Ride hailing, we do think they're going to start a ride hailing service this year. Wow. They're going to compete against Uber and Lyft. Uh, we believe if they do that, and, and again, we think they will, uh, we think that the bear case is history. Um, and so when we see it past uh, uh, 1500 to 1900, um, we're not worried at all. And in fact, our base case, which is in the 7,000 range, this is again a five-year target. Mm -hmm. Our base case will also go up if they do launch this ride hailing network because we have not included uh, that. And in our base case, we have simply assumed that they keep their share from last year, not lose it. Uh, uh, so... Uh, I, I believe I'm right. We may, we may be assuming that it does go back to 17%. I'll have to check on that. But, but nonetheless, so we're at 1,900 now, 7,000 before ride hailing. It will go up with ride hailing. Our minimum hurdle rate of return for any stock in our portfolio is 15% at a compound annual rate over the next five years. That means a doubling over five years. So at 7,000 plus, 
versus 1900 now, we're still well above that. It's still one of the most, uh, we believe it will drive more performance than most stocks in our portfolio, even today. Now, with the legislation or uh, with in California, and obviously Uber has been affected with it, having to have full-time employees, would a Tesla be affected by that? Would their ride hail network be affected by that? Or it's just, these are Tesla drivers and, and they're just taking advantage of their Tesla car and connecting with other drivers and, and driving to from one location to the other. Well, even, uh, well, Tesla could actually hire these people, make them full-time employees because uh, the, the total cost of ownership for a, a, a Model 3 today mm -hmm. is about 30% less than a Toyota Camry. Uh, mostly because of the residual value. Okay. I've, uh, in fact, I've seen uh, some Model S's uh, selling for 90% of what people bought uh, them for. Oh and we God. think the Model 3's will be even better if those become the ride-hailing network cars. So what's going to happen? Tesla will say to a person, join us and, and for $5,000 down or $7,000, buy a, uh, well we'll let you buy a model 3 you can work the rest of the price off and oh by the way it's going to be cheaper for you than a, a toyota camry so they will do that and then what does that do if they if they drive uh, uh for 50 percent or 60 percent of the day compared to the five percent of the day that i drive and less than that now that we're that i'm not driving to the train station yeah um, they're going to be delivering uh real miles data, real miles traveled to Tesla to feed its autonomous network. Wow. Uh, so we think they have somewhere between 14 and 15 billion miles worth of data. The, the, just like what I mentioned with the uh, genomics based data in Vitae, mm -hmm. same is true in the autonomous taxi network. The winner is going to be that company with the most data and the highest quality data and the best AI deep learning neural network expertise. Uh, and they're doing some very interesting things with um, video labeling uh, in the AI uh, area, which we think has them miles. I mean, there's just no one's even close. No one, Google's not close, Cruise Automation's not close, no one's close. And even in China, Baidu was supposed to be the autonomous taxi right. platform. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, we, we just learned that uh, NVIDIA is no longer included as a part of that platform. It's now Xilinx, which is an FPGA. That is, FPGAs are not going to be driving autonomous taxi networks or platforms. So we think even in China, Tesla might have more of a shot at the autonomous opportunity than we expected. We expect them maybe to get 10% of that market. We do think each market's going to be a, a natural geographic monopoly. We think Tesla will get the bulk of the US market. We wow. didn't think that about China and we still don't think that about China, but Baidu is suggesting to us or the moves they've made recently that hmm, maybe even Tesla has a shot there. Now, one of the criticisms of Tesla and the self-driving cars uh, or that, that initiative is they've, they've kind of got, taken a different route. They've, they've maybe tried to be a little bit cheaper on, on some of the things or doesn't analyze as well. Because I, I guess, what, a few years ago with Mobileye, they, yes. they kind of had a falling out with them. And so they were going to do it themselves. So do you see any concerns uh, with that? Or, or you still think that you know, these guys are definitely going to be the, the first ones or most likely going to be the first ones to really get to that stage five, I guess, with self-driving? Yes, I, I, I do believe. I, actually, uh, Elon is saying that he's been um, driving to and from work pretty much without, uh, in the prototype of their full self-driving car, pretty much without uh, having to intervene. Um, so I, I think they're, what I love about Elon Musk is he's, he, he's the guinea pig. Yeah. He's willing, <laughs> right? right. Um, and, uh, and, and I believe him when, when he says that. So they, are, they probably, because of the billions of miles of data, they have seen more cor corner cases uh, than I think most auto manufacturers and technology companies will see in the next five years. 
So it's going to be very tough for anyone to catch up to them. So now I, I found it interesting, maybe it was six months ago or a year ago, when they announced that they were going to get more into the insurance business too. How do you think that's going to affect uh, their, their model? Yeah, I think this will help them in on the ride hailing uh, side of things. Okay. I remember uh, talking to Uber drivers and the insurance costs were killing them. I, I mean, I really felt terrible for them. They were getting, you know, the, 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 the hikes they were seeing were enormous. Um, so Tesla knows more about how its cars are going to perform with autopilot uh, than any insurance company will. So Tesla will self-insure. We're, we're pretty sure of that. And so the insurance costs are going to come down uh, dramatically. You know, when, the, when NHTSA did the uh, analysis on the first fatal crash, um, uh, the Model S fatal in Florida, um, it took them six months to do that study, but after they finished, and remember, this was about three years ago, yeah. uh, even NHTSA stated in its report, I may not have this exactly right, the wording, but they said that anyone driving a Tesla car with autopilot was going to uh, uh, experience 40 per, was going to be 40 percent safer. Now, was it 40 percent fewer accidents or fatal accidents? I don't remember, but 40% safer. Any insurance company knowing that would price accordingly. They're not willing to do that right now. Insurance companies are a little bit uh, behind the times. They don't understand this autonomous concept. Uh, Tesla does, so it can self-insure. Perfect. Let's go very quickly to one more stock here. Uh, let's go to Square. And, and what, what, what do you like about uh, this company right now? Uh, Square is uh, becoming the first uh, branch bank in our pockets or pocketbooks. Uh, it is going to disintermediate the banking system. Uh, its cost of customer acquisition is $20. Why, why is it, whereas a bank try, trying to get a credit card company, a customer, we know this from all of the solic solicitations we You're get. Right. 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 So credit cards or, or checking accounts, savings yeah. accounts, they're willing to pay uh, anywhere from $350 to $1,500 per customer. Wow. Why? Wow. Think about your own behavior, my behavior. Yeah. I have been at the same bank for 20 to 25 years. Right. I have. It's a pain to change and, right. you know, habit. Uh, now we are seeing the disruptor coming in from, they started with the unbanked and the underbanked, and that's where they dominated for a while, especially in the South and Southwest. Now we're seeing the demographics pick up. The reason their cost of customer acquisition is so low is they've got a viral network. My children are very happy to have me on uh, the Cash App, right? Yeah. They, they, they're very happy to. <laughs> but what they, about Venmo versus the Cash App? Uh, is, uh... Well, Venmo, uh, yes. And uh, Cash App is out marketing Venmo right now. They're both growing very rapidly, but Cash App is out marketing Venmo, okay. um, uh, you know, uh, with uh, Cash App. Uh, what are they? What are they called? Cash App Fridays and the different prizes they give, like Bitcoin and so forth, and um, and and co-marketing with Fortnite and uh, oh, wow, wow. Travis Scott and all of that. So yeah. they're they're doing some unbelievable things that way. They also have the other side of the ledger. They uh, started with small businesses and merchants, and what they've been able to do is because they know the merchants swipe uh, the credit cards through the square, right? Their square, mm -hmm. their right. sale. Um, the square knows every minute of the day, every second of the day, how these businesses are doing. And so it's going to them and saying, hey, you're doing really well. Would you like a working capital loan? Hey, you're yeah. doing really well. Would you like a, to buy another piece of equipment? Huge. A bank has no idea how these companies are doing. They get, for every piece of data that a Square has on a company, uh, I mean, for every, I should say, 10,000 pieces of data or bits of data, uh, a bank might have one. Uh, so, and, and it'll be lagged by weeks or months. So we're talking about truly disruptive innovation that we believe is going to transform banking transform financial, they're offering um, 
the, uh, securities, equities, so trading now through the Cash App, just like Robinhood is. Uh, they're going to offer insurance. So uh, watch out, financial services. You are about to be hollowed out. So I often say this to our clients, prospective clients. I say, you know, we're a great hedge against those passive indexes you're in right now, especially with those robo-advisors, Wealthfront and, and others. Um, well, uh, I, I would also be careful because the transformation that these five innovation platforms that we're focused on, DNA sequencing, robotics, energy storage, artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, those five innovation platforms, which are involving 14 technologies, are going to disrupt every sector. So you may think you have a cheap looking portfolio, an inexpensive, a good value, but it might be a, a value for a good value for a reason. It's being disintermediated. It's a value trap. So be careful. That's perfect. Well, Kathy, I know you have to, to run. So thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you. My pleasure, Irusha. It's been my pleasure. So next week, we are going to have Jay Jacobs of Global X ETFs on the show. Jay is a senior VP and head of research and strategy at Global X. So that's it for this week on Investing with IBD. I'm Arusha Ferris, and thanks for listening. <laughs>